the political psychologists and the behavioral economists look to see whether states or individuals actually do act according to the dictates of expected utility maximization. But nevertheless, the key point is there is one definition of rationality, which is expected utility maximization, that sits at the heart of both the rational choice enterprise and the political psychology enterprise. And we are going after that definition of rationality and offering an alternative definition which focuses on theory and deliberation. I'm Jack Goldsmith, and this is the Lawfare Podcast, September 22, 2023. It is commonplace for American leaders to describe their fiercest foreign adversaries as irrational, crazy, delusional, or illogical. In their new book, How States Think, The Rationality of Foreign Policy, political scientists John Mearsheimer of the University of Chicago and Sebastian Rosato of the University of Notre Dame argue that these claims and many similar ones are often wrong because they're based on a flawed understanding of state rationality and in international affairs. I questioned Mearsheimer and Rosato about why they think most states act rationally most of the time in developing grand strategy and managing crises. Among other topics, we discuss how their theory of state rationality differs from rational choice theorists and political psychologists, why understanding state rationality is important to success in international affairs, and why Mearsheimer, a harsh critic of U.S. expansion of NATO and of the U.S. choice to pursue liberal hegemony after the Cold War, nonetheless argues in this book that those decisions were rational. It's the Lawfare Podcast, September 22, How States Think. John and Sebastian, your book is a defense of state rationality in international politics. And to this non-IR scholar, it seems obvious that states exercise a kind of rough means-end rationality in the sense of defining goals and seeking to adopt means suited to achieve those goals. And one of your conclusions in the book is that most states are rational most of the time, like that's a surprising conclusion. So I guess my first question is, who doesn't think that most states are rational most of the time, and why did you need to write this book? Well, Jack, I think uh, when we first started writing about the topic, the first thing that struck us was that policymakers in the West love to talk about their adversaries as non-rational. So, you know, Saddam Hussein was ra- irrational back in the day, Mahmoud Ahmadinejad, uh, Hugo Chavez, Gaddafi, the, the list goes on and on. And of course, today it's Vladimir Putin. So th- there's a, there is a large contingent in the policy community that thinks of U.S. adversaries as non-rational. Then there's scholarship on non-rationality. This is the so-called behavioral revolution in the social sciences. It started in economics um, with uh, Kahneman and Tversky, the thinking fast, thinking slow literature. So we found that both in the policy world and in the academic world, there was a lot of emphasis on non-rationality. And we were surprised by that because we, like you, had always assumed that states were rational. In fact, it's the basis for how we've thought about international politics since uh, the get-go. So let me ask you, when, when leaders say, when American leaders, you open the book talking about how uh, American leaders unanimously said that Putin was irrational, illogical, et cetera, to invade Ukraine, and you just gave some other examples – do you think that they mean that? Do they really think that Putin and uh, Saddam Hussein and the like are irrational, or is that empty talk? It's hard to be absolutely certain what they really think, but based on the way they make their arguments and how frequently those arguments are made, one does have the sense that they believe it. And as Sebastian pointed out, it is important to emphasize that you have this growing body of literature, both in economics and in political science, uh, especially international relations, that says that individuals as well as states often behave in a non-rational or irrational way. So it wouldn't be surprising if deep down uh, these policymakers do believe that someone like Vladimir Putin or Saddam Hussein is irrational. 
though I would add that there's also a chance that it's because they disagree with the policies that those states are adopting. And it's easy to call that non-rational. If they do something that you think is wrong, there's a natural tendency to call them irrational. I don't think you're saying that they are irrational in, in terms of you, you know what rationality means, but uh, people often dismiss people they disagree with as irrational or crazy or whatever it might be. Yeah, that's so that's the sense in which I take it. And I don't want to come back to this point later after we get your theory of rationality um, on the table and ask you more questions about it. But let's – why don't you just explain – your very very clear, very basic, uh, easy to understand theory of what it means for a state to be rational. The whole book is admirably clear. It's it's really well done. Thank you for the kind words. I'll take a crack at this. Basically, our argument is that rationality uh, is based on how individual policymakers think about the world, and then given the fact that individual policymakers think differently about the world, the question is, how do they collectively reach an agreement? How does the state come to agreement on what a particular policy should be? Now, to go back to the individual, our argument is that human beings are theoretical at their core. They think about the world in very theoretical ways. So individual policymakers have different theories in their head, and those theories inform the policies that they prefer for dealing with a crisis or for formulating grand strategy. But the problem is that there are a good number of credible or plausible theories that individuals can adopt. So you oftentimes run into a situation where a group of policymakers have different theories and therefore different policy prescriptions in their heads. But nevertheless, each one of those theories and the associated policies are rational because there can be different rational policies and different credible theories. And that brings us to the second part of the story, which is how do those individuals collectively reach a policy decision. And our argument is that you have to have a deliberative process, a deliberative decision-making process at the collective level to ultimately get a rational strategy or a rational policy. Okay. Two other features of, of your account of rationality that I'd like for you to get out on the, on the table, please. One is Let's just deal with this one first. You emphasize this point. It's very important for your claims that rationality is not about outcomes. It's really about the ex-ante perspective. Is that right? Yeah. So as John said, when John was describing rationality, he described it as a process. It's a process of coming up with credible theories. It's a process of deliberation. And we think of rationality as a process. We don't think about it in terms of outcomes. and. The reason we don't equate rationality uh, with success is that it's quite possible in the complicated world that policymakers operate in to be rational, i.e. to have a credible theory, to deliberate carefully amongst themselves and still fail to achieve their objectives. And there are a number of reasons for that. The first is that theories are limited. Even the best theories have limitations, anomalies. Um, so you might just pick the wrong theory. If you believed in Norman Angel's credible theory of economic interdependence before World War I, it just happened that the theory didn't operate in that case. You thought the July crisis would end peacefully, but you get war. So there, there are limits to theory. The second problem is, let's say that the theory actually works, then there are information problems. Imagine you have a theory, a well-known, credible theory, um, that's about the balance of power. And you might just not have information that allows you to measure the balance of power accurately, especially if your adversaries are trying to hide some of their capabilities. So the second problem is information. And then there's luck, circumstances. Things change in unexpected ways. Uh, you get into a dispute with another state, and it turns out that it has a regime change or it makes a major technological breakthrough. 
So there are a number of reasons why you could do everything quote unquote right and rationally in the process and yet fail to achieve your outcomes, which is why we don't equate the two. Okay. The the point about information deficits was the other one I was going to ask about. So you answered that as well. Okay. that That's the basics of the theory as, as I see it in the book. And my, my first reaction is that it's a fairly thin theory of rationality and that the definition is fairly easy to meet. There's a large inventory, that's your term, of, of very credible, dif- a very different credible theories, various stripes of realism, various stripes in the liter- liberal t- tradition, variations of constructivism, all credible theories. There are ever-present informational deficits, which mean that there may be several possible decisional outcomes, even maybe under one, the chosen theory, through a proper deliberation process. And the deliberation criterion strikes me as it's not meaningless at all, but it's mostly purely procedural. It's just making sure they took into account all the evidence and uh, and deliberated about it. So I, I, my first unfriendly question is, have you saved rationality by dumbing it down so much that it, it's pretty easy to meet? I don't think so, Jack. First of all, there's no question that there are a good number of credible or rational theories. No doubt about that. But we also make it clear that there are a good number of non-credible or irrational theories. For example, we talk about the domino theory. We talk about racial theories. We talk about the clash of civilization. We talk about nuclear coercion. These are all prominent theories in the literature that don't fit under the rubric of credible theories. So we have a body of theories that are designed to make sure that the bar is not too low. Furthermore, we point to a number of cases where states do not act rationally. We're not arguing that states act rationally all the time. There are clearly some prominent cases where they don't. Uh, And for example, we talked about the Bay of Pigs case. We talked about Neville Chamberlain in 1938 and his approach to dealing with Nazi Germany, which was not a case of rationality. So I think that when you look at the body of theories that we point to, and when you look at the various cases of non-rationality that we point to, uh, that's good evidence that the bar is not too low. And I'll just add to John's point. John made an excellent sort of empirical case for the fact that we have identified a bunch of non-rational theories. But if you just think about it conceptually, in the book, we explain that in order to be a credible theory, you have to meet three criteria. Those are not easy criteria to meet. And a number of theories uh, fail on those criteria. That's the first point. Second point is that the theories we talk about, the inventory of credible theories, these liberal and realist theories that you mentioned, these have been debated for decades, maybe centuries, some of them for millennia, and they've survived. They've survived academic intellectual combat, and that probably means they've cleared a pretty high bar. And as John said, um, many theories fail the test. The other point to make here is there are a lot of non- theoretical ways of thinking. And so th- th- there's there's not only non-credible theories that don't count as rational for us, but there's also other ways of thinking, analogies, heuristics, expected utility maximization. So uh, all of that is to say that I think the bar is conceptually pretty high, and as John made the point, empirically pretty high. Jack, if I can just jump in again and sort of embellish this point. When we dealt with a number of our our interlocutors as we were writing the book, there was a powerful tendency among some people to want to argue that there should be one theory, in fact, my theory, that is evidence of rationality. In other words, if a state behaves according to my theory of international politics, then that state is rational. And what we concluded, and we argue in the book, as you know, is that there are a number of credible theories. And even though Sebastian and I may have a preference for one theory or another, we concede that 
there are a good number of other theories that we disagree with that are nevertheless credible theories. There's a large body of evidence out there that provides support for those theories. And that's why we end up saying that you have this rather large body of credible theories. And even if we disagree with them, when a state employs those other theories, that state is behaving in a rational fashion, even if we think it doesn't make sense from our own perspective. A lot of people have difficulty accepting the argument that there can be multiple credible theories, and therefore rationality has a rather broad definition. But the fact is, I don't think you want to get in the business of arguing that it's my theory or the highway. Uh, if I could just embellish just a little bit further, one of the big determinants or the, the, the key determinant we found that separated credible from non-credible theories was the amount of empirical evidence that supported them. And once you get into empirical evidence, it's a very tricky issue. It's very difficult to rule out theories or rule in theories because evidence in international politics is scarce and it's unreliable. Imagine that you're interested in the causes of war and you examine World War I, which we know an enormous amount about, but it's only one war. That's the first point. Um, so the evidence is scarce. Second, um, the evidence is unreliable. Uh, you can read everything you want about the origins of World War I, and you can come to the conclusion that this was a bid for European hegemony. You can read the same evidence and come to the conclusion that it was a tragic accident. Uh, you can read it and say that this was um, proof of the famous democratic peace theory that democracies don't fight each other. And you can read it and you can say Germany was a democracy and democracies do fight each other. So just the, the, the difficulty of adjudicating between theories and ruling theories out as non-credible is a much more complicated, tricky issue than you might think. So I agree with you both that there are multiple credible theories. And I wasn't I wasn't challenging that. And, and those were good responses. But let me ask the and but my question is is how promiscuous the theory of rationality here is. And let me ask the question a different way. In any particular situation, I mean, I can't remember, I think you'd list with the variations of realism and the variations of liberal internationalism and a few others, there may be 10 different variations. Maybe you want to group them in three, maybe six. But there are several credible theories that U.S. decision makers have at different times embraced. And when you take that fact, when you take information that so any of those theories are available for an administration, there are informational deficits. There's a deliberation process. There are the preferences of the participants. And then there's the final decision maker. It does seem that one consequence of your theory of your, of your book and your understanding of rationality is, is there are in any given situation of grand strategy, decision-making or crisis decision-making, there could be lots of possible rational decisions. Is that right? I think that it is the case that in most of the instances that we looked at, the policymakers had a variety of different theories about what the situation was all about. And as a result of having different theories, they came up with different policies. And this is why deliberation is so important. If you're France in the 1930s and you're dealing with, it's the late 1930s, and you're dealing with Adolf Hitler, it's not perfectly clear at the time what exactly the threat looks like. You don't know exactly what Hitler's ambitions are. And therefore, you bring to the table, different theories about how to interpret him. And those different theories lead to different policy prescriptions. And what's necessary in that French case and all sorts of other cases is to have deliberation so that you can reach some sort of resolution on which is the best policy. But this is just the way the world works. It's an uncertain world. 
And people are not too sure what to do in most cases because they don't have a whole heck of a lot of information and they bring their theories to the table. And again, you get different theories and that's why deliberation is so important to figure out which is the best theory and therefore the best policy for dealing with the problem at hand. But just to to reiterate the question, then I'll move on from this. But even through all of that, there are lots of possible, in most situations, you describe this in your book, in most of these situations, there are lots of possible decisions, uh, decisional outcomes that would meet the rationality criterion in, in, in most of your cases. Is that fair? There are, but I would, I would note that in the, if, you, if you look at the cases, it's pretty clear in each case that what we're talking about is maybe one or two competing theories. In, in a lot of cases, by the way, there's consensus amongst the decision makers from the get-go uh, about the right theory. And then when there is disagreement, it's not as if um, that disagreement is, is a violent disagreement between completely different theories. It's perhaps a defensive versus an offensive realist view of the world. So uh, I, th- I think there are a handful of theories that occur, reoccur again and again and again. But to say that um, there are many, many theories that occur again and again and again doesn't accord with the historical record. Okay. Let's talk about a couple of more theoretical matters, then we'll move into some case studies. So you've mentioned a couple of times how your theory of rationality differs from the standard economic account, and then the behavioral economic account. Can you can you explain that? Sure. Our approach, as has become apparent over the last uh, few minutes, is a theoretical approach. It, it's for us, rationality and theory are inextricably linked. For uh, expected utility maximization scholars or thinkers. That is a data-driven approach at the end of the day. And I just need to stress here, these are fundamentally different ways of thinking about the world. Uh, We we think in terms of assumptions and causal logics and supporting evidence. Expected utility maximization is all about a magic formula that weighs costs and benefits, lists a series of possible outcomes, and then, this is an important point, uses data and probabilities to establish uh, the likelihood that certain outcomes will emerge and then uh, picks the one that has, quote unquote, the the highest expected value. But that's the fundamental difference between us. We're theory driven. uh, The the, uh, consensus view, uh, the gold standard, um, I would argue, until we wrote this book is, is a data driven approach. And as you said, it's called expected utility maximization. And just to add on to that, Jack, it's important to understand that there are sort of two bodies of literature that deal with the rationality problem that we're addressing. One is the economists and the rational choice people, and the other are the political psychologists. That's what I meant. That's what I meant by behavioral economics. So political psychologists, yeah. Yes, behavioral economics. Yeah. So talk so talk about that as well, John, please. Well, the point is that the political psychologists or the behavioral economists use the same definition of rationality as the rational choice people do. For the political psychologists, right, uh, and the behavioral economists, rationality is expected utility maximization. The only difference that we see between the two is that the economists and the rational choice theorists tend to say that states act as if they employed expected utility maximization. That as if phrase is very important. Whereas the political psychologists and the behavioral economists look to see whether states or individuals actually do act according to the dictates of expected utility maximization. But nevertheless, the key point is there is one definition of rationality, which is expected utility maximization, that sits at the heart of both the rational choice enterprise and the political psychology enterprise. And we are going after that definition of rationality and offering an alternative definition which focuses on theory and deliberation. And by the way, neither 
the rational choice people or the behavioral people have a uh, way of dealing with collective decision making. In both cases, the emphasis is on the individual. And our argument is that you have to bring deliberation into the story to really assess whether or not a state is rational. And just to put a fine point on the fact that rational choice theorists and political psychologists think the same way about what rationality is. For the political psychologists, non-rational decision-making is what they call analogies or heuristics. And the important point to note there is that analogies and heuristics are bad data analysis. So the, the argument out there is that if you do good data analysis, you establish probabilities, and then you work through the formula, you get good results. If you do bad data analysis, i.e., you do analogies, you think in terms of heuristics, then you get you get non-rational policies. So a couple of follow-ups. I mean, is it really true that rational choice theorists don't have theories of preference aggregation and deliberation? It just seems to me that whenever I see rational choice theorists talking about deliberation and preference aggregation, they're always talking about how it breaks down and results in irrational decision-making because of voting paradoxes or public choice problems and the like. But they have theories of preference aggregation and deliberation, don't they? Our reading of rational choice theory is that they don't. One of the fundamental assumptions that undergirds that whole enterprise is that it's about individuals. And they acknowledge that they have an aggregation problem. Very, one of the most famous political uh, scientists who engaged in rational choice theory was Bob Powell. Bob Powell is open about the fact that they have an aggregation problem. And so what do they do to overcome the aggregation problem? They simply take um, their arguments about individuals and then either assume that decision, state decisions are made by a single individual, so you don't have to talk about aggregation, or they treat the state as if it were not a bunch of different individuals, but just a single individual. Um, so they don't address the aggregation problem. They admit that they have a problem with it, and they have as yet not moved away from their individualistic emphasis. I would also add to that, I don't think that rational choice theory is really all about theory. It's a data-driven enterprise. The idea is that you are confronted with a particular problem, and what you do is you figure out what is the policy that you favor and what are the possible outcomes that that policy will lead to. Then you rank order the outcomes, you assign probabilities, you assign costs and benefits, you do the math, and then you pick uh, the policy that leads to the outcome that gives you the greatest benefit or the greatest utility. There's no theory involved in this. It's data-driven. But what's the difference between, and again, I don't, I'm not trying to and don't want to defend the rational choice theorists here. But what's the difference between the models that they build to try to model behavior and what you're calling a theory? Well, first of all, it's just very important to understand we're not talking about models. We're talking about what is rationality and rationality for economists and for rational, for most economists and for rational choice theory is expected utility maximization. Right. And expected utility maximization, it's a formula. It's a magic formula. Right. And it involves figuring out what's the best policy, what are the possible outcomes, and then plugging in data. That is not a theoretical enterprise. A theoretical enterprise is coming up with simple explanations about how the world works. Right. And those explanations uh, are based on assumptions, causal stories, and empirical claims. And the whole uh, expected utility maximization program has nothing to do with coming up with theories. Again, it, 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 it's, it's sort of a magic formula. Yeah, a theory is a simplified description of reality 
that explains, as John said, how the world works. It, it, it's the workings. It's about cause and effect. If I do something, what will happen? If X happens, what, what is likely to happen with Y? That's what theorizing is about. It's about um, developing causal stories about how one thing leads to another. There is no causal story in rational choice theory. Rational choice theory is about the best way to make decisions, and the best way to make decisions is to establish costs and benefits, and then to establish probabilities of various outcomes, and then just do the math, and that's data. There is no attempt in there to understand cause and effect and how the world works, which is what we think is the fundamental basis of theory. Okay. Talk about how you disagree beyond their commonality with the rational choice theorists on expected utility. Talk about what you disagree with in the, the approach of the political psychologists or the behavior like economists, whatever you want to call them. Well, one difference is that the political psychologists believe that decisions are made on the basis of analogies. Uh, for example, you get into a crisis with Vladimir Putin, and what you want to do is think about the Munich analogy. And that Munich analogy should influence how you think about dealing with Vladimir Putin. That's one possibility. Another argument that they often make is that individuals, and here we're talking about states ultimately, rely on heuristics. Heuristics are basically simple rules of thumb. And the argument that they're making is that individuals and states do not carefully think about the situation that they're facing, and they don't come up with policies that are based on theories about how the world works. And we find that to be an implausible argument. If you're in a crisis, say the Cuban Missile Crisis, are you really going to rely on a heuristic or a simple analogy? Aren't you going to think long and hard about how to deal with that problem that you're facing? The Cuban Missile Crisis is what we're talking about. Aren't you going to think about what the Soviets are up to and what is the best way to deal with getting those missiles out of Cuba? And isn't that policy that you come up with as an individual going to be informed by a particular theory about how the world works? In other words, if you think you should use military force against those missiles in Cuba, isn't that conclusion going to be based on a theory? And then furthermore, aren't you going to have deliberation? Aren't the individual policymakers who have different theories and therefore different policy prescriptions about how to resolve this crisis going to get together and talk at some length about which is the best policy prescription of the lot for dealing with the problem. I think that at a purely logical, a purely logical basis or commonsensical basis, that's what you would expect to happen. And that's what you see happen in every case that we examined. You don't see people using heuristics or using simple-minded analogies. They come up with policies based on theories, and then they deliberate. And that's consistent with the argument that we make in the book. In every case we look at. I would only add one point, which is that don't forget that this um, literature uh, on political psychology is all based on subjects in a laboratory and how a subject in a lab is going to respond to certain questions or certain hypothetical scenarios when nothing is at stake versus a real leader in the real world who's facing the prospect of nuclear war, that's going to be a very different situation. And I would point out, by the way, that political psychologists admit this. They, they believe they have what they call an external validate, val validity problem, which is that their arguments um, that are based on lab experiments maybe don't translate to the real world. Okay, but let me follow up on that. So, it wouldn't shock me at all if leaders, even in crisis situations where we're making important decisions, if they engaged in analogical reasoning to some extent, if they looked at historical analogies and, and tried to learn from the past, it wouldn't shock me if they were subject in some respects to the availability heuristic 
forget the, la- the laboratory experiments. I mean, we, we've just, it wouldn't shock me if, if they were influenced by these psychological factors. So the question is, are you claiming empirically that those, that analogical thinking and heuristics are simply not a part of the decision-making uh, that, that simply don't influence the thinking of individuals at all ever in, in these important con- contexts, or are you claiming that it gets washed out through the deliberative process or both? We're, we're agreeing with the way you just laid it out, which is that they don't use analogies and heuristics in those situations. I wouldn't put it quite as strongly as never. But look, there's no question that when you're facing a decision about grand strategy or a decision in a crisis, you do have to think quickly. Uh, It's not as if you have, especially in a crisis, you don't have the leisure of waiting and batting ideas around. But our argument is that it's theories that enable you to think quickly. Theorize, theories are these simplified descriptions of the way the world works. And so they perform the same function as analogies and heuristics, which is that they allow you to make decisions quickly, uh, but they are fundamentally different. And then when we go and look at the cases, that's what we see. It, we were shocked to the extent that people spoke in theoretical terms, that they talked about the balance of power that they referenced theories, not explicitly, they're not aware that there's a theory called defensive realism out there, but the language that they used to talk about uh, the case is defensive realism 101, or it's democratic peace theory 101. Jack, if you took all of the cases that we looked at, and you said there must be a literature out there produced by the political psychologists and international relations that demonstrate that individual policymakers in those cases use heuristics or analogies, you would quickly discover that there's hardly any literature at all. And in fact, what's going on here is that you have all sorts of claims being made about heuristics and analogies being of tremendous importance for policymaking on the foreign affairs front. But when you look carefully at the literature, there is no body of evidence that supports the argument that uh, heuristics and analogies matter very much in the process. And I would point out to you that if you think about how serious these cases are, we're talking about major foreign policy decisions that have all sorts of consequences for the country at hand. You would expect those people to think about the implications of what they're doing in the most serious way. You would not expect them to rely on rules of thumb or simple analogies. Yes, they're going to look at historical cases, but historical cases underpin theory. The argument about analogies is that you can take one case like Munich and apply it to dealing with Vladimir Putin or Saddam Hussein, and that solves the problem. You see no evidence that that's the case. Yeah. So I was, I wasn't, I know that there's not a robust empirical literature in the, in the political psychology IR literature, but what you said was, you just said it doesn't matter very much that stuff. And that's all I was trying to figure out. I mean, it seems implausible to me, especially if we're talking about, you know, you talk about crisis decision-making over days and weeks if we're talking about crisis decision making over hours, and and I guess this is kind of outside your theory because when there's not time for full robust deliberation and the like, you can imagine analogical thinking and and, and heuristics having more of a sway there. It also seems to me that analogical reasoning is kind of pervasive, even if it's not important in these fully deliberate not not crucial in these fully deliberated processes. So I was just asking. What you just said, John, was we shouldn't expect it to matter very much in these highly deliberative contexts. And that's what I was trying to understand. But the point is, Jack, a crisis, right? A crisis is not going to last a few minutes or even a few hours. These crises last weeks, if not months. So decision makers do have time to think carefully about what the best policy is. So 
I would agree with you that if they were forced to make a decision in a five-minute time period, they would probably rely on heuristics or analogies. But that's largely irrelevant to what we're talking about here, because you just don't see evidence of those kinds of cases in international politics. I would just say, though, it is pretty clear from the empirical record that when a crisis hits, it doesn't take more than a few hours for the policymakers to decide what they're going to want to do. And those decisions are made in terms of theories. I, I don't think you want to think of theory as something that takes you a long time. It's something that you have, um, as a policymaker, have imbibed over the years. You have a worldview, the way the world works, and you can apply that pretty rapidly. There is no question that in a matter of hours, there's limits to the amount of deliberation. But I, I don't think it rules out the use of theories instead of heuristics. Yes, I wasn't claiming that it did. I, I, I agree with that. Okay, let me ask you about some of your uh, case studies, and I'm going to focus on the U.S. examples that I know best. You give a lot of really interesting examples of rational behavior, of, of examples of rational state action that some people have claimed wasn't rational. And one of them was, you say it was rational for the United States to expand NATO after the Cold War. And the reasons you give, in a nutshell, and this is almost a quote, was that the decision in the Clinton administration, correct me if I get any of this wrong, but the decision ultimately made in the in the Clinton administration was based on some version of liberal theory, and it was a credible theory. But the theory, the theory of the decision was, and this is a quote, that Moscow would see the world in liberal and not realist terms, that Moscow would embrace democracy, and that it would become. It would want to become. This is not an exact quote. Would want to become a responsible member of the world community. Something like something like that is what you said was the theory that they were operating under in deciding to expand NATO. And I don't. I just, I just didn't fully understand why that theory rested on credible and realistic assumptions, which is which it needs to do for it to be credible under your theory. So could you explain that? Did I get any of that wrong? Basically, the decision to expand NATO involved a major fight between two different schools of thought. One was a realist school of thought, which said that expanding NATO would lead to serious trouble because the Russians would view that NATO expansion as a threat to their security and they would respond in ways that would produce some form of conflict in Europe. That was what the opponents of NATO expansion argued. The proponents of NATO expansion employed a series of liberal theories, which argued that if we spread NATO eastward and we incorporated more and more countries into NATO, that would produce peace. Now, why is that the case? Number one, it would help us facilitate democracy in Eastern Europe and ultimately facilitate democracy in Russia. And because democracies don't fight other democracies, we would live happily ever after. Furthermore, we would expand the EU as well as NATO eastward. This would facilitate the growth of economic interdependence, the growth of prosperity. This would work to the advantage of Russia, as well as countries in Eastern Europe, and that would promote peace as well. And furthermore, we would bring more and more countries in Eastern Europe and maybe ultimately Russia into these institutions. And once states enter into institutions, they become responsible stakeholders. So the whole idea behind NATO expansion for these liberal Theorist was that expanding NATO was a way of promoting peace in Eastern Europe. The Russians would understand that, and maybe ultimately they would be brought into the whole enterprise as well. And they basically rejected the realist view that this would lead to trouble. Now, the liberals were basing their argument on a series of credible theories, theories that have real standing in the academic world. It's not like they were pursuing cockamamie uh, policies based on foolish theories. These are you know, firmly established theories. Now, 
realists argue that this would lead to disaster. And I believe that the realists have been proved correct. But the fact is that if you look at the actual decision and you don't look at the outcome, the decision was made on the basis of a series of credible theories. These liberal theories are credible theories. And that's our basic point. But my question is, but to be a credible theory, it has to be based on realistic assumptions, you say. And I'm just surprised to hear you say that it's a realistic assumption to say that Moscow would see the world in, re- in liberal terms, that Moscow would embrace democracy, and that Moscow would ultimately become a responsible member of the liberal international community. It surprises me that you think that those are realistic assumptions. Well, for a realist, I don't think that that was smart strategy. But it's a credible theory, which means on your view that it rests on, and we're using realistic in two senses here, you mean on plausible assumptions. Well, yes. But I mean, just take Frank Fukuyama's very famous piece, The End of History. This is an argument that basically says that democracy is spreading across the world. Right. There's been a significant growth in democracies around the world as of 1989 when he wrote the piece. And then, of course, throughout the 1990s and very early 2000s, the number of democracies on the planet increases. This feeds into the liberal view that the United States is basically a benevolent hegemon, a benign hegemon. The Russians will see it that way. Uh, They're eventually going to become a democracy because democracy is the wave of the future. And therefore, marching NATO eastward is not going to lead to trouble. The fact is that that worldview was based on a series of liberal theories, right? Economic interdependence theory, democratic peace theory, and liberal institutionalism that had lots of cachet in the academic world. And people thought that the Russians would not view it as a threat. Realists, of course, disagreed. And I think that the realists have proved correct on this. But in terms of the actual decision, I think it was a decision This is NATO expansion that was based on rational theories or credible theories. I think the thing here, Jack, is that you say you don't think that the uh, policy was convincing because it rested on what you called unrealistic assumptions. But no, I was asking whether you thought it rested on realistic assumptions. I was just surprised because in your book, you say, tell me if I'm wrong, that for a theory to be credible, it has to rest on, it has to be, have a plausible basis in reality. Mm-hmm. And it has to have a plausible causal story. And I'm just surprised, I was just surprised in reading this, that both of you think that it was plausible to think that Moscow would see the world in liberal and not realist terms, that Moscow would embrace democracy and that and that Moscow would ultimately become a responsible member of the world community. That I was I, mean, I don't have a I don't have a bone in this fight. I'm just trying to. I'm just surprised that y'all embrace that view. No, no. J- just to be clear, we don't embrace that view. You don't believe in that theory, but you embrace the view that that's a plausible view. Yes, it is a plausible view, and the reason it's a plausible view is that there is evidence out there in the political science literature, in theoretical literature, that says that states that become economically interdependent or become hooked on prosperity or capitalism or whatever you want to call it tend to become democratic. That's that's a plausible theory. That does not sound to me like an unrealistic assumption. There's evidence out there that states that um, join institutions uh, change their preferences over time because the, co- the benefits of being part of that institution, in this case, the world community, uh, the benefits are very high and the costs of exiting the world community uh, equally high. So, Those don't strike me as unrealistic assumptions. Another point that's very important here is that NATO expansion was not aimed at containing Russia. There's no evidence that we saw Russia as a threat and believed that what we had to do was move NATO eastward to contain the Russians. What we were interested in doing was spreading democracy economic prosperity and institutions eastward. 
And we believe that this would be in the Russians' benefit, that they would not see it as a hostile act. Now, realists like Sebastian and I believe this was foolish, but they believed, right, based on these very important theories, that the opposite was the case and that we could move these institutions, especially NATO, eastward. And because it was not being directed at Russia, the Russians would understand that. They would see us as a benign hegemon. and We would live happily ever after. So I understand. And, and this is really the point you made earlier, and it's an admirable point, which is that you know, y'all have preferred views and preferred theories in international relations. And in this book, you're stepping back from those views and you're saying that there are a series of plausible theories that decision makers might embrace. What's jarring, and I'm not saying it's a contradiction, it's just jarring, is that for those other theories to be plausible, under your view, they had to have a basis in reality. And the same thing came up, John, in, in, in the argument that it was rational for the United States to pursue liberal hegemony after the Cold War. You wrote a great book called The Grand Illusion that argued that from the beginning, liberal hegemony was destined to fail. And it was pretty devastating account about why that was a terrible theory. But in this book, you, you have to defend it as a plausible theory in saying that states are rational when they re- rely on it. And it's just, it's just the nature of what this book is. It's the point you said earlier that in other work, you're arguing among competing theories. And here you're stepping above that and talking about what it means to be rational. Is that the right way to think about it? Somewhat. There's no question that there is a certain level of discomfort on my part and on Sebastian's <laughs> part in arguing that these liberal theories that underpin liberal hegemony and NATO expansion were uh, rational. But the point that you want to understand is that these policies were based on theories. Right. right? Which is very important to understand that we are theoretical human beings. In fact, Sebastian and I wanted to title the book Homo Theoreticus as a (laughs) Homo Economicus. I think think the one you chose is better. (laughs) (laughs) The publisher agrees with you completely. (laughs) But the the point, Jack, is that we are arguing that theories really matter. We are theoretical human beings. And the question then becomes, when policymakers push a certain policy, is that policy based on, you know, uh, theories that have some standing? That, that that are that are credible theories that are that are reasonably powerful theories, and if you look at the liberal theories that are in the literature, I think there's no way you can argue that they're incredible or irrational theories. Democratic yeah. peace theory, economic interdependence theory, these are theories that have a rich pedigree, and lots of people believe in them. We don't, but lots of people <laughs> okay. Will. Yeah, and I think I think a clear distinction has to be made here between plausible or credible theories and non-credible theories. Uh-huh. And then when you get into the credible theories, there are people who think their theory is right and the other theories are wrong. But it's a big difference saying that you think another theory is wrong and saying that it's non-credible. If right. you're saying it's non-credible, you're saying it's based on unrealistic assumptions It has a deeply flawed causal logic, and there's hardly any evidence to support it. And it would be crazy for us to say that about theories like democratic peace theory, which I um, have attacked in print, all liberal theories, which John has attacked in print. You know, it'd be crazy to say that. Okay, I'm not going to keep pushing this point, but I thought that was the whole point of John's book on the Grand Illusion. The whole point of that book was to argue that the theory was wrong, not yeah. that it was not it was implausible. No, remember, you want to remember the book that we're talking about is a book about rationality. Right. It's a question of whether or not policies are rational or not. Okay, so you leave out of your story any discussion, I believe, of the influence of interest groups on foreign policy decision-making in these contexts. You focus on the executive branch and you don't mention Congress at all. Can you just explain why those institutions don't have an impact on rationality in the sense you're talking about? Yeah. 
this came out of the empirical examination of the cases. We actually went into the cases thinking that we would see a lot of influence by, I know, public opinion, interest groups, um, Congress in the U.S. cases, et cetera, et cetera. But what we found was that when decisions are made about grand strategy and when crisis decisions are made, it inevitably becomes a small group. Uh, John and I, when we would talk about it, would use the term that decisions are made inside the room and the room doesn't contain uh, many policymakers. Now, there is an extent to which interest groups and public opinion matter, but that's the realization in the room that the policy you're about to pursue might be anathema to the public or that it might be opposed by your political opponents. But there what happens is that they stick to the policy and they decide that they will just deal with the domestic fallout as best they can or that they will use their position at the top of the um, decision-making hierarchy uh, to, to make those problems go away. But we, we saw hardly any emphasis on what interest groups, domestic politics, domestic public might think. And indeed, the military, the military, uh, these are obviously, many of these cases involve military force. They were called in to give opinions about feasibility of certain operations uh, and so on. But uh, they were not part of the decision-making process. That was the small group in the room. It's further confirmation of really the vital importance, importance of executive power, that executive power is what's making these decisions. There's no question about that, Jack. It, it, it's quite amazing, as Sebastian said, uh, how little influence domestic politics had uh, on all of these decisions. They were made by a handful of people. So what explains, I want to ask you to talk about non-rational decisions. You give a handful of examples. And if you could talk about the Bay of Pigs invasion, and I was, you know, one of your conclusions is that the whole theory of victory, the air campaign would work, the amphibious landing would work, there would be a mass insurrection was just wrong. And you say obviously wrong to American planners. And in particularly, and this was the CIA's plot, but so explain that and then explain how could they how could they have gotten it so wrong, especially if it was so obvious. It's it's hard to understand cases of irrationality. And uh, so could you explain that example and explain why why non-rationality occurred there? Well, it's a truly amazing case because as you said, Jack, they got things so wrong when it came to the theory of victory. Uh, there was no way that the strategy that we were employing at the Bay of Pigs was going to work out. One could argue that what the CIA was doing here was that they recognized that this was going to fail, but they saw this as an opportunity to get the Kennedy administration to double down and therefore get deeply involved in Cuba once the invasion failed. So in other words, the argument here is that the CIA knew that the operation would fail, but thought that would be okay because it would get President Kennedy to commit to overthrowing Castro in Cuba, which he was not completely committed to doing in the eyes of the CIA. So you can make that argument. But even if you get away with that argument, the fact is that there was hardly any deliberation at all. Kennedy had come into the White House in January of 1961. He was handed uh, this scheme by Eisenhower as Eisenhower was leaving office. And then the actual invasion took place in April of 1961. So Kennedy, in effect, was still wet behind the ears. There was hardly any deliberation at all. And the end result was that you had this disaster. Yeah, I would only add one thing, which is certainly the CIA ran the train here and let's just say that they bamboozled the administration. But there was non-deliberation by the Kennedy administration too. Uh, Kennedy was asked at one point, um, what do you think of Operation Zapata, which is what the invasion plan was ultimately called? 
And he said, I try and think about it as little as possible. <laughs> so there was, it's, so it, it's not only that he was, that um, the non deliberation was happening because the CIA was withholding information, silencing the military, ignoring the skeptics. There was almost no curiosity from the Kennedy administration. And I would argue that the reverse happened in the Cuban Missile Crisis the following year when clearly Kennedy had learned his lesson and asked a ton of questions and actually changed his mind in the course of the crisis. But you don't talk about this in the book, so maybe you don't know the answer. But I don't understand how I mean, you describe the plan as just wrong-headed from top to bottom. And yes, there was no deliberation at the White House level or very little deliberation. But how do we do we know how this crazy plan emerged and was supported by the agency? And why did ration, why did irrationality happen at that level? Do we know the answer to that question? I just don't know. The plan initially emerged in the last year of the Eisenhower administration, and it was being developed uh, over the course of that last year of the Eisenhower administration. And then President Eisenhower handed it off to President Kennedy. And once Kennedy or the Kennedy administration got hold of the plan, it changed more and more. And I think with the passage of time, uh, the plan got changed to the point where it became almost impossible for this to ever work. Uh, I think one could argue that the planning process during the Eisenhower administration left some possibility that it would eventually morph into a feasible plan, but that didn't happen. And it's hard to say exactly what happened in the Kennedy years or, or in, in the Ken in the months, uh, those early months of the Kennedy administration, but it, it's quite clear that this whole plan took on a life of itself, a life of its own, and that the Kennedy administration didn't have that much enthusiasm for doing it. The CIA certainly did. And the end result is that by April, they had this cockamamie plan uh, that didn't make any sense at all. But Kennedy felt he had no choice because he had go, gone so far down the road, but to launch the boats. And they did that and it turned into a colossal failure. Yeah. And as John said, the, the plan changed greatly over time. So the original plan, which I think was called Pluto during the um, Eisenhower administration, may have had a chance of working, but uh, a great deal changed. They changed the landing area uh, to a place where it was unlikely they were going to be able to land successfully. They also landed far further from the, their uh, supporters who were supposedly going to start an insurrection against Castro. So what was a bad plan to begin with, but maybe had a shot, um, became a terrible plan over time. Okay, for my last question, I want to return to what we talked about at the beginning, and that is this idea that you document about how U.S. leaders very often paint their adversaries as irrational, illogical, crazy, delusional, and the like. And the thrust of your book is to explain why in very, very many cases this is a mistake, and, and you explain why you think it's a mistake to assume, for example, that to think that Putin was acting irrationally and in invading Ukraine. But I want to return to whether or not that pervasive talk, and it is a pervasive feature of the American foreign policy scene that senior leaders talk that way often. I mean, if it's not cheap talk, if it's not just, as I think Sebastian said, just a way of describing decisions you don't like, if they really think that their adversaries are acting irrationally, I mean, are they making judgments on the basis of that? And if they, and if they were, would that be, an element of irrationality. I mean, isn't it, and it, putting it another way, is it a dangerous, is it a dangerous mistake to assume that your adversaries are acting irrationally when in fact they're acting rationally? Because if you think they're acting irrationally when they're acting rationally, you don't understand what's motivating them. And it seems like it would skew your foreign policy. So I just wonder what you think of that. And if you want to talk about in particular, whether you think U S policy towards the Russian invasion suppers and this mistake. I would love to know it, but I'm really interested in the general question. Well, I think there's no question that at a general level, we think it's a fundamental mistake to assume uh, that your adversary is 
irrational right off the bat, because that means you're not going to understand what your adversary is up to. And you are therefore not likely to formulate a smart policy for dealing with your adversary. Just very important to understand how your adversary is thinking as best you can so that you can come up with a clever strategy for dealing with that opponent. And if you go to the Russian case, I think uh, you see lots of evidence of uh, this line of argument to play. We basically argued that Putin was irrational. The the U.S. government assumed that uh, Putin was irrational and that he launched this unprovoked attack uh, that made no sense at all and was guaranteed to fail. And when you have that view of an adversary, you really don't have much choice but to think in terms of decisively defeating that adversary, really delivering a hammer blow on that adversary, because you're dealing with an irrational adversary and you can't reason or compromise with uh, an irrational adversary. The fact is that Putin was not launching an unprovoked attack. He was launching a provoked war. He was provoked by NATO expansion. And if we had understood from the get-go Uh, that NATO expansion was viewed by him and his lieutenants as an existential threat, we could have smartly backed off and worked out some compromise. But we refused to believe that. We thought that he was irrational, that his view of the world was fundamentally uh, mistaken, and that what he was interested in doing was creating a greater Russia. And the end result is we have this disastrous situation today. And just to flip it around here, it's a dangerous mistake to think that they're irrational. There's also great benefits to thinking that they are rational, to assume that they have uh, credible theories about the way the world works, that they're going to deliberate carefully about their moves. Um, the, The title of the book, as you know, is How States Think. And we think states think rationally. So there are great advantages to knowing that. Now, that is not foolproof. You can still you know, think that they have a different theory from the one they have, and it may be that in that case they didn't deliberate, but it's better than the alternative, which is just assuming axiomatically that they're irrational. Okay, so that sounds like that you think that, the, at least in the Putin context, that the U.S. government claims that Putin is acting irrationally is not just rhetoric, that they really believe it and they're basing policy on it. And so my my real question and my final question is, if you're right that Putin was acting rationally on your view and you're under your theory, and if you're right as you seem to suggest that it's not just rhetoric, it's 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 a it's a genuine belief by U.S. senior leadership, then is the U.S. response based on that very mistaken assumption? Does that mean that our response is irrational on your theory, or does it satisfy rationality? No, the response is rational because once Vladimir Putin invades Ukraine, the United States is now thinking in balance of power terms and argues that he has to be repelled. So in the, in the situation that they found themselves in after the invasion, that the United States is acting rationally. So from the perspective of rationality, the mistaken belief that Putin is acting irrationally doesn't matter. Put it slightly differently. You can have two actors that are both behaving rationally, Vladimir Putin and the United States, and you can end up in a whole lot of trouble in international politics. And that's because it's an uncertain business and there are limits to theory. Yeah. So that's one of the great conclusions of your book. And it's um, an important conclusion that this is the tragedy of international politics, to borrow a phrase that rational actors, rational states interacting with one another can lead to horribly destructive consequences. It doesn't mean that it's irrational behavior. I would add one caveat to that, Jack. Okay. That is, we have to be careful here not to identify rationality with outcomes. Uh, I disagree with what you just said. But for us, rationality is all about the decision-making process. And let me underline the word process. It's not related to outcomes. There's a very important tendency in the literature to define rationality with outcomes. 
In other words, if you have a foreign policy that leads to disaster, people then conclude they reason backwards that that's an irrational decision. The fact is that you can make a very rational decision and end up in a disastrous uh, situation. So you have to keep outcomes and process separate. And what we're talking about here is the decision-making process. Yes, I agree with that. And I didn't mean to say otherwise. And and I understand that point. So thank you both very much. It's a really terrific and thought-provoking and clarifying book. Thank you for having us on. Yeah, it was a great pleasure. Thank you. The Lawfare Podcast is produced in cooperation with the Brookings Institution. You can get ad-free versions of this and other Lawfare Podcasts by becoming a Lawfare Material supporter at patreon.com backslash lawfare. You'll also get access to special events and other content available only to our supporters. Please rate and review us wherever you get your podcasts. Look out for our other podcasts, including Rational Security, Chatter, Allies, and The Aftermath, our latest Lawfare Presents podcast series on the government's response to January 6th. Check out our written work at www.lawfaremedia.org. The podcast is edited by Jen Patia Howell, and your audio engineer this episode was Ian Enright of Goat Rodeo. Our music is performed by Sophia Yan. As always, thank you for listening.